Gentlemen, welcome on stage. Mr. Secretary General, um, let me start by you really explaining what quantum, no. Um, <laughs> let me start by asking you, together with artificial intelligence, advanced biotechnology, quantum technology, as you were just referring to, is part of this massive technological wave that sort of with unprecedented forms seems to be transforming society, global affairs, um, very much what NATO is at the heart at. When thinking about this technological wave's potential, promise, but also perils, um, are you generally worried or excited uh, heading up NATO on this? Is this an opportunity or something to be fearful of? I'm both uh, uh, worried and excited, and I think that's always the case with uh, uh, technologies. Uh, uh, I guess those who develop uh, nuclear technologies uh, uh, so, uh, in the 1940s, they were both excited and, uh, and worried. And again, I watched uh, Oppenheimer, and they were both uh, worried and excited. Uh, so, 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 so I think that's, that's, the, that's a kind of basic thing that uh, characterizes almost all uh, uh, technologies that there are big opportunities, but of course also uh, big uh, dangers and, uh, and challenges. And that's uh, in particular, uh, I guess that's uh, almost in all fields, but uh, in particular in the field of security. They can be used to protect freedom, they can be used to uh, attack freedom. Uh, they can be used uh, to suppress uh, people, but also uh, to, uh, to enhance the rights of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of people. Uh, so, so that's the reason why I think it's so important that NATO is focused on this, and, and that's exactly what we are, all these new technologies. In one way, NATO has been, since the atomic bomb, uh, 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 the, the leading on almost all advanced technologies, and we had thought that was a, a kind of obvious thing, that we always uh, had this technological edge. That's not as obvious anymore. Uh, uh, not least because we have China, uh, which, uh, which is investing heavily in new technologies, using big data in a different way than we are able to do. And therefore, we need to, uh, that's one of the reasons why I need to, uh, to, uh, to, to understand the challenges that China and the, and the growth of China poses to our, our security and why we have established uh, uh, the Innovation Fund, uh, why we have uh, established Diana, why we are uh, uh, developing networks and ways to ensure that. Uh, NATO allies, uh, public and private sector, uh, ac academia across the alliance are uh, working more closely together, and this uh, conference is part of that effort. Excellent. Is, if this is the Manhattan project of the 21st century, um, the way you're describing NATO's role, is there something apart from Deanna and the investment fund that you would hope to say, you know, if we are to really win this race, is there something additional you think we've got to do? Uh, so, yes, there are many things, but, but I think there is, you have to understand that there is, there is a different. NATO is partly what we do as NATO, and I think then what we have just done over the last uh, few years is quite important, and, and, and we have put it much higher on the agenda. And David van der he's down there, he can go into all the details, our Assistant Secretary General, uh, responsible for uh, all these uh, efforts. Uh, so these are the tools we use as NATO, also the Innovation Fund, the, uh, the Accelerator, the, the test centers and all that. And, uh, and we just, as I, just a couple of years we started to establish all these new tools. But of course that's only the kind of the, uh, the, the top, uh, because the most important thing where really the, uh, uh, the, uh, the big efforts are taking place is in the, is in the different nations. Uh, uh, so we are, we are uh, we are, in a way, uh, helping to share best practices. We are helping to increase awareness. We are helping to, uh, to, uh, to, to coordinate efforts. Uh, but, of course, most of the researchers, mo mo most of the projects are uh, national-owned and national-developed. Uh, 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 and, then, and then I'm sure that together we can really make sure that we continue to, uh, to be leading also in quantum uh, physics and, uh, and in new uh, disruptive technologies. But there is one big change, or many changes, but one uh, big change since, uh, since the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. Because before, uh, most of the new technologies, the most advanced technologies, especially those who are relevant for the uh, uh, defense sector, for our de uh, defense industry, they were state-owned, publicly owned. Nuclear Manhattan, that was driven by the governments. Uh, internet was driven by uh, by uh, by uh, by uh, governments, and uh, and um, and and many other. Uh, the jet engine, which was a big uh, in, uh, invasion, also uh, just before and, and during the Second World War, driven by governments. So we used to own these technologies as governments. We financed them, we controlled them, and they were state secrets. 
Now, most of these technologies are in the private sector, uh, whether we like it or not. And, and it's much harder to distinguish between, uh, uh, what should I say, defense technologies and civilian technologies. So the importance of us working with the private sector, as a government, NATO allies, uh, working with the private sector has become just uh, even more uh, important. But also for the private sector to be, to be aware of that what they do has security implications. This is not only con uh, commercial issues. If you just share all your technologies with authoritarian states because you can earn money, that's dangerous. And it's really dangerous. So, so I, I used to believe in a kind of very uh, clear division of responsibilities between governments and the private sector. But the reality is that we live now in an age where private commercial decisions have huge political implications. And therefore, we need to develop, uh, refine uh, the rules of the game when it comes to the relationship between government and private sector, because if the private sector only seeks profits, we'll end up in a very dangerous place. You will share too much technology with uh, states which uh, will use it against the free and open societies we, we believe in. Thank you, Secretary General. Um, Minister Busco, let me turn to you. Um, most of the people in this room who are not quantum physicists will probably call themselves sort of talented amateurs when it comes to understanding this. Because quantum is technical, it's challenging, it's complex to understand for decisions makers and citizens alike. What is the role of government to create trust, public trust in this new type of technology? Um, how does the Danish government try to sort of avoid the hype while, you know, at the same time harnessing the opportunities and doing it in a field that is complex to probably 99% of the population to understand? Well, what we should do is exactly what uh, uh, Jens just said. I mean, uh, realize that uh, business politics, uh, investing politics, uh, trade politics on this area here is also security. So, uh, so we have to uh, uh, frame uh, or create the right platform for uh, uh, investments, uh, public-private investments. Uh, just yesterday, as already mentioned here today, we presented the part two of our uh, investment in uh, quantum uh, technology. Uh, we are later on today visiting uh, the new center for that. Uh, I'm extremely happy for not only Denmark, but, but also for NATO that we are actually uh, able to have within NATO a, such a, a high intensive environment as the Diana project actually is. I mean, it's a diamond in research and development that we have in NATO and that we have in Denmark. So, uh, so, so um, I will say what we should do is uh, to do what we have done um, f within a number of areas, um, take the fight against the climate change, take the, 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 the work for a sustainable development. Denmark has been put in front in, in green technologies, green investments, offshore, onshore, wind, all of that. With what? Public-private partnership, public-private investments, uh, strategic uh, areas uh, chosen for long-term investments, uh, and what you saw, uh, what you're seeing here today, and what you saw yesterday, and what you'll see this afternoon is exactly that. That when we work together, we are able to, uh, to, to, I mean, to create something that we cannot create alone. So say, may sound like a political, really political answer, but it's it's actually what it is. We have to work together because we are up against. Uh, forces, uh, other countries, investments that are so large and so heavy that we simply have to work together. And then we have to have an alliance because uh, this is foremost, it is security policy as it is today. It might be a politician answer, but a very good one indeed. You've also been the Minister of Defense, and so talking about this public-private collaboration and the opportunities and the ability to balance both, there must also be some challenges. Isn't it at some point that the national security interest where that sort of ends and the innovation opportunity? So is there something in balancing this dual use nature of technology? Is it sometimes uh, choosing innovation over security or can we have both? No, I don't think so. I think we are in a, uh, I mean, we are in a completely other world now than we were 10 years ago. I think that's the bottom line. Uh, we are looking into a new kind of globalization. 
uh, we are looking into a, a, a much more tensions between the U.S. and China. Europe has to find its way. Uh, we have to strengthen our alliance, towards, especially towards the uh, Atlantic, and we have to use that as a fundament for handling uh, top, top issues as, for example, uh, security and uh, investment in uh, quantum uh, technology. I mean, we are past the days where we could see, uh, say that this here is, is a job to do for the private sector. It's not, I mean, we are, those were the days. We are in a complete other global environment today where uh, competition is uh, so hard and where uh, it's clear what we see that competition is also about getting first uh, from a security perspective. So, so I think uh, what's driving the investments and that my view on the invest necessary of cooperation and investment, public-private investments here is first and foremost that this is also a security issue. And, uh, and then, of course, there is, uh, for a small country as Denmark, enormous potential. I mean, what we... Uh, have gathered here today what we had uh, at the conference yesterday yesterday at the uh, Maersk uh, Tower here in, in Copenhagen was, uh, I mean, an enormous uh, amount of, of interest, uh, knowledge, uh, uh, investment, uh, uh, and so on. So, so there's enormous possibility for Denmark also, of course, here. But, but first and foremost, I think we must realize that we are in a complete other world than we were 10 years ago, and we have to take that into account when we are discussing issues like this. Thank you. Mr. Sandel, let me turn to you as one of the uh, very significant actors in this different global environment that the Minister and the Secretary General just talked about. Microsoft is a global technology company. Most of us use your products daily, I assume. Um, your products have both broad civilian use like AI and cloud, but when it comes to quantum, also the dual use nature of it. Could you talk a little bit about how you think about the opportunities inherent in quantum, but also the risks that you have to overcome and maybe reflect a little bit what the Secretary General and the Minister were talking about? Yeah, and thank you for having us here today. And I, I've been very pleased being here to see the amount of alignment um, that, uh, that I've seen. First of all, I just want to concur. I think the strength of the West is public-private cooperation. Uh, I thought you captured it very well, Mr. Secretary General, on where these balances are and the security requirements that we have. So I just want to reaffirm that. As we think about this kind of engagement, there's three key things that we want to look at for guiding principles for our company, and we, we think perhaps that can be informative. Uh, the first one is basically around security and competitiveness. We have to secure our infrastructure, but while still embracing the competitive nature, and I've heard that many times, so we concur with that. The next one is what I would call economic and defensive readiness. Uh, one of the benefits that we see out of the technologies in areas like chemistry, material science, and things like that, things that could have impact both on sustainability as well as manufacturing. How do we get ready to both get those discoveries, but then figure out how do we harness them, both from a domestic and jobs market, but then from the defense perspective uh, in understanding that. The third one we think about is, is societal good. We want to make sure that when we invest in the technology, it really is something that is actually beneficial to all of humanity. I think that's really important. If we think about clean water, sustainability, we can unlock a lot of innovation that's there. It's not all just about profit. How do we make sure everyone has equal access? Um, that is something we care about, all of those things. And when I look at some things that are concrete around this, as an industry, we got to get going on post-quantum cryptography. Uh, that's an area where, and, and frankly, a lot of it has to do with, do we have machines that can crack crypto tomorrow? You know, a lot of folks, I worry, they think it might be a decade out. Uh, the truth of the matter is, it would still take us a decade, even if we had solutions today. So getting a, a sense of proper urgency across NIST and the European uh, Union, as well as the standards bodies that are there, let's pick those, actually update it. Go after national defense, we have to do that first. Critical infrastructure, super important to all of us as sovereign countries and for our citizens. And then we'll go after the broader ecosystem. Those things have to land. And then I think enabling the spirit of innovation, like I mentioned, we think material science is a great one. How can we use that for sustainability purposes? How can we essentially remove some of the reliance on rare earth metals and change that? How do we get less toxic systems out there today, like remove some forever chemicals and things like that? So these are the places that we think are beneficial. And of course, the defense examples that were given as well. So we want to make sure that as we do that, and the final thing I'd say, we do absolutely see a major role for government. You mentioned AI, that's another case that has some parallels to that. Uh, we might 
talk about that later as well, but it really does amount to, I don't think that as a commercial company, we can't be setting public policy for the world. That really doesn't make any sense. We have to have that right decisions around what is a responsible use of technology, whether it's AI or quantum or biotech, and then what are the ethics that we would apply around that? And that's something best done in partnership with government, not with private industry deciding what that looks like. Just following up on the Secretary General's comment, really technology companies with your size is becoming geopolitical players. Has that changed how Microsoft takes decision? You know, and the board directors of Microsoft, is it also thinking not only what is good for business, but also what is good for NATO? What is good for European peace and security? What is good for transatlantic cooperation? How does that translate into the business decisions you take? Yeah, it, and it's something we talk about in our, you know, basically executive meetings all the time, every single week. Uh, it really is interesting because we are such an underpinning. If you think about cyber is another great example. Uh, we've published a lot of reports, you know, about what the work that we've done in Ukraine, basically helping the government remain sovereign, even if their data centers, you know, were under duress, uh, in addition to helping thwart cyber attacks. Uh, it is something that's super important for us. We have to make sure that we're protecting all the users of our software. And like I mentioned, this public-private cooperation, we have a deep sense of responsibility around that. And it also gets super interesting for us because once again, we can make decisions if we do them wrong that could actually cause geopolitical escalations. And we shouldn't be doing that, right? Deciding what works where and you know, who gets what. Once again, I don't think that a private company should be making those decisions. So a lot of the conversations we have is about how do we engage with regulators? How do we figure out a way to, you know, but again, responsibly and ethically use the technology and introduce it and then make decisions around that so that the folks that are elected are the ones that are making those calls. So we spend a lot of time thinking about that and how we actually engage with that. We welcome that further engagement as well. Uh, no private company, uh, not just mine, no company should be doing that unilaterally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Professor Knight, let me uh, turn to you. Um, in the beginning, when we had a show of hands of who was an optimist and who was a pessimist, I believe I saw your hand as a slight pessimist. Could <laughs> you talk about how do you see the development of quantum technologies as a peace project? What would, it, what would it take for it to become a peace project? Okay. Investment in any technology that's relevant to defense and security is a way of providing assurance that we can live in a peaceful society. That's the whole point. That, that uh, as long as we do invest in technology that could be transformative in terms of capability, allows us to defend our citizens so that they can live a peaceful world. Quantum is part of that. It's an enabler. Um, and one of the things that, that, that we, we should be sure about is that what quantum technology does, it provides assurance that we can make the world a more resilient place. So resilience is underpinning so much of what we're trying to do in quantum technology. Uh, resilience against, for example, GPS outage, the ability to navigate. We can provide new ways of quantum navigation uh, that gives us a backup. Our timing systems can be made resilient. Our ways in which we look at the world around us. Um, these are peace projects in the sense that they are assuring our population that we are doing something about making their lives sustainable and resilient. So that's my first comment. Um, the other part of it, in terms of peace projects, there are so many things you can do. For example, we will be able to put quantum sensors onto spaceborne platforms and it will monitor the way that the geoid changes. That's going to be transformative. It connects again with dual use because of ISR but we would actually work on those things together. But the ability to measure our world accurately is part of what we're trying to do. Resilience is really important. Now, I am a pessimist in the sense that I do not think yet we put enough effort into making our, um, our communication systems resilient. That, that, that's a serious issue. Uh, we talked about post-quantum cryptography earlier. My worry on this is that there are no security proofs for any of the post-quantum what they are, are resilient against attacks by Shaw and Grover, but there might be another way of doing it, attacks on Shorty's lattice vector and so on. We have not yet put enough emphasis into saying that we need to roll out on the same time scale or faster the defense against these attacks 
to make it resilient. And that's why I'm a pessimist on that one, because I do not think we've put enough resource in yet uh, on, in the international community. We talk about the NIST candidature. It's early stage, and we need to do so much more and so much faster. Thank you so much. Secretary General, um, I want to come back to you. Um, often when we think about NATO and new technologies, it's often in a sort of procurement relationship. You're a large buyer, representing large buyers, buying new technology. What I hear here is a bit more of a strategic partnership with the tech industry, but one that you are, I would argue, probably not used to having that type of engagement with. Uh, it's a new field. How do you think about NATO and NATO's role and maybe NATO's um, how to innovate NATO itself to have that more strategic conversation, collaboration, the partnership <coughs> that is sort of a changed geopolitical world? Well, so first of all, we have a strategic relationship with the defense industry uh, and also with the companies uh, uh, like Microsoft, which is uh, not only uh, as I say, not to regard as defense industry company, but what Microsoft does matters, of course, uh, also for, uh, for uh, defense and, and, uh, and the different uh, defense uh, capabilities. Uh, we have had that for many years, but, but we need to do more, we need to deepen it, and, uh, and, it, did, uh, and it needs to be uh, 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 dynamic, uh, meaning that, uh, for instance, I totally agree that, of course, the elected uh, 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 bodies, governments, parliaments have to set the, the, the rules, the laws, uh, the, the main regulations, uh, but to do so, we need to engage with industry, because this is a fast-developing technology. So, 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 so what is r right today may be wrong tomorrow and, uh, and vice versa. And, and for me, we have one example of many examples, but one quite recent example is, is, is 5G. Uh, not so many years ago, um, uh, most NATO allies thought that that was only a commercial decision. Uh, and, and, and it took some time inside NATO and actually quite tough discussions among NATO allies whether we were going to have any kind of uh, NATO policy uh, uh, addressing uh, the, the security aspects of 5G. And then the reality was that it ended uh, uh, concluding with that, yes, of course, 5G is a commercial thing, it's a private thing, it's a, there are huge investments, and, and, and we have to trust the, the private sector doing that. But, but, but we need to realize uh, the security aspect if, if uh, our 5G network was controlled and owned by uh, a Chinese uh, a company. And that impacted both commercial decisions and government uh, decisions. So I, say, I, I would say the kind of conversation we had uh, among allies, but also between allies uh, and governments and, uh, and, and the industry as we developed our policies <coughs> uh, as NATO, but also as, as nations uh, on 5G is an example of uh, awareness <coughs> and, uh, and uh, and policy uh, uh, development, uh, um, proving that, 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 that NATO has actually have an important role uh, to play in these, in these strategic uh, uh, decisions. Then, if I may add one other thing, and that is that, of course, pa a pa the, U the war in Ukraine has changed many things. It has also changed the way many of us uh, in, in this part of the world, in, in Europe and also in North America, but perhaps in particular in Europe, uh, uh, regard the importance of or assess the importance of the defense industry. Mm -hmm. Because I remember, and again, we speak about a couple of years ago, that many investors and also, you know, uh, those who were uh, ethical, high value, or those ethical investors, they didn't want to invest in defense industry. There were guidelines, there were, there were, there were policies that they, they shied away from the defense industry because that, that was unethical. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and academic institutions didn't want to cooperate with them. And, uh, and the reality is that one of the key issues now in defending freedom is that we need a vibrant, strong defense industry to deliver what we try to deliver to Ukraine every day. I, I, I came actually back from Kiev uh, uh, also uh, tonight, or also, no, in, also this morning. And, and, and the main issue we discussed with President Zelensky is how can we ramp up production, partly of very standardized things, as 155 millimeter uh, uh, ammunition, but also drones, uh, cyber, uh, more advanced things, and, 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 and 3G printing. We need investments, we need innovators, we need the, acad uh, the academics, uh, we, we, need, we need the private sector. And it's nothing unethical in helping Ukraine defending their, their, their freedom. And we have seen now a shift. But again, I don't know 
who, are you, who all of you are representing, but actually in a, in, in a forum like this a couple of years ago, there would have been people who would have shied away from the idea of working with the defense industry. Also, defense is extremely important to protect freedom. Minister Busco, if today the ethical thing to do is to be part of the defense industry, what do you think are the new values that should shape this type of public-private relationship where um, the ethical thing is to be part of developing the technological edge? Could you talk a little about then what are the values we as you know, Denmark and Europe really should be putting into this? Well, I think, again, as Jens just said, I think it's, I mean, it's relatively clear the world has changed. I mean, uh, we are, I mean, there's war in Europe. Uh, I mean, I'm a, uh, uh, I mean, I'm the, so say, fall of the Berlin Wall generation. I've lived in the, uh, in the iPhone uh, globalization where my, my, uh, my friends, they slept uh, outside the, the shops where we could buy the new iPhones to, just to have it first. I mean, what we, what we are, are witnessing now is a, a, a complete different world. We have one Europe. We have, uh, we have uh, daily, uh, I mean, tensions, growing tensions between China and the U.S., uh, selected areas where you, you uh, defend uh, your, so say, your new technology from other uh, countries or firms to enter the, the field. Um, so, so there, there is a complete other world now. I think um, what we have to stick to is, uh, first and foremost, uh, our values, of course. Uh, I still believe that, uh, I'm a still a firm believer of the values that has spread through Europe when the, we had the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, I work for them every day, and that's also what we work for in NATO. I mean, it's, that's clear, but we are up against regimes, uh, uh, leaders uh, with, uh, I mean, a totally uh, other view on how we should develop the world. And uh, that, of course, has to, af uh, to affect our cooperation uh, within the European Union, within uh, NATO especially, and also uh, in the areas where we f are trying to form investments like we are in the area of quantum uh, physics, but there's also a lot of other areas. I mean, being the first with the new uh, offshore windmill is also security. I mean, getting the right components as fast as possible is security. So the world has changed, and that's why, I mean, uh, we sh should stand on the values that spread through Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall. We should fight for them, we should defend them, that's what's actually going on in Ukraine right now. That's what we saw. I mean, I was Minister of Defense. Jens and I were discussing this when uh, the Russian had, uh, we should remember the second invasion of Ukraine uh, one and a half year ago. And that was what we discussed. So, so I think we, and we should admit the world has changed and we should see investments and areas that we are discussing here today in that light. That's the way it is. Thank you. Um, Sir Knight, I want to come back to you. Um, Deep also referred to the famous 1950s letter from Nils Bohr to the United Nations, where he talked about both the promise and perils of nuclear, almost taking the role of a diplomat rather than a, a, uh, a professor. Could you talk about the role of the scientific community today in helping uh, not only inform us and help shine light on the technology development, but much more importantly also, what is your role in making this public-private trusted partnership work out? Well, obviously working between the academic community, the entrepreneurship, startup community, and the investor community is part of what we've been trying to do for a very long time now in quantum, uh, enabling ways in which we remove any barriers between them um, so that one informs the other. Um, having spent a long time advising UK government in, in these sort of technology areas, um, I will say to those techie people in the audience, people who are not technicians, who are running governments, think we speak in Martian. Okay? We speak a different language, unintelligible, full of mysterious concepts. So clarity of expression about what the technology can do, what it may not do, removing hype, 
providing assurance on all of these things. The scientific community is eager to do this because, don't forget, the whole principle of scientific research is to check that things are valid and are testable. The Royal Society has a motto, nullius in verba, take no man's word for it. And so part of the scientific community's responsibility in this environment is to provide authority, to provide common sense, and then God help us to speak in languages that are intelligible and to have that partnership. The world has changed very dramatically. Um, the scientific community now is much more entrepreneurial. Uh, many of the really great things in, in quantum technology are emerging from academia, have moved into startups. You know, here in Denmark, you know, Peter Lodal, who's in the audience, moving and creating Sparrow in the UK, Steve Briley moving and creating River Lane and so on. This entrepreneurial spirit uh, is, is, is has been a wonderful transformation over the last decade or so in quantum. But using those people as our ambassadors to say, this can be done, that may not be possible, is really important. Looking at capabilities, one of the things I decided a long time ago is when I'm talking to end users in government, don't use the quantum word. It frightens people. <laughs> Talk about new capabilities. You know, the ability to see the, the invisible world, to secure your information, to look at your, your, your infrastructure. Um, I think we could probably come out of the closet now and talk a bit more about, about the quantum world without frightening people. But it still is a scary topic. Let's talk about capabilities and let's be realistic. We are coming up on time. Jason, I want to give you 15 seconds, maybe just to tell us what is the most important value that Microsoft is going to bring to the table in this? Well, look, I mean, uh, once again, I just want to reaffirm what, uh, uh, what, what Professor Knight just said. I think that one of the things that we can do as an industry is make sure that we're being intellectually honest, that we don't go feed a bunch of hype into the system. There's a lot of noise out there in the systems today. We should explain what you can do. We should explain what it cannot do. Uh, we explain where it could be in the future. This is why I'm excited about the startup ecosystem in place we have here. Our, some of the most consequential work that we do in our quantum program is right here in Denmark, has been for years, uh, uh, right down the road in, in, in Lingbo, and we're going to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're excited about the developments that are there. Let's be intellectually honest. Let's work together on what the ethics are. So as tech companies, don't do it because you can. Figure out how you should do things and where the kind of boundaries are first, and then let's get realistic and not and then pick an incremental path that adds value along the way. I'm a big believer in, you know, in, in the States, we would call it show me, uh, which I think is the equivalent of that, which is let's go see it work first, and then we will find a path through it. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have come up on time. The world is indeed changing. It requires new ways of working, but with your leadership, I certainly rest assured after this 30 minutes that we are heading the right path. So please give a big applause to the phenomenal panel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.